In this video, I will demonstrate how to calculate numbers needed to harm. This is an evidence-based practice calculation that we typically do to try and get a sense of how much of an effect exposure to a negative risk factor or some sort of risk factor or maybe the effect of a medication in producing side effects may have and also to indicate how likely it is that the exposure to this risk factor or medication would produce an adverse outcome or, or a negative side effect. Now in order to calculate this value there's a few preliminary calculations that we need to do in order to get to the numbers needed to harm and I'll define these briefly and then we'll go into an example of how to calculate this. So the first first calculation is known as the risk or the event rate and this is just basically an idea of the frequency of a particular outcome and we typically have two event rates that we calculate one is known as the experimental event rate and this is the frequency of occurrence of a negative outcome in the group exposed to the treatment or exposed to the risk factor that we think may be causing the negative outcome and then there's a control event rate and this is the event rate for the control group or the participants not exposed to the risk factor or to the uh, treatment that we're interested in. The next measure is a relative risk and this exp expresses how many times it is more likely an outcome will occur in the exposure group, in other words the experimental group, compared to the control group. So how much more likely is the negative outcome to occur in the experimental group? And we typically use the value of 1.0 is the relative risk kind of baseline. So if there's a relative risk of 1.0, that means that the control group is just as likely as the experimental group to have the negative outcome. As that value changes, that indicates more risk in the control group versus the experimental group. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we evaluate um, our example. The relative risk increase gives us an idea of how much the increase in the rate of the outcome might be in the exposure group relative to the control group. So how much more risk is there being exposed to the uh, risk factor or the experiment in the experimental group. Then we have an absolute risk increase which expresses the absolute difference in the rates of the outcomes between those two groups. And then lastly we have the number needed to harm. And this is the number of patients that need to be exposed to the event or the risk factor in order to produce one undesirable outcome. And again, this gives us a sense of how much exposure or how many people need to be exposed to produce that one undesirable outcome. So it gives us an idea of the magnitude of the effect this exposure might have in producing the undesirable outcome. So SPSS will not automatically calculate these values for us, but what we can do using SPSS is get a 2x2 two two contingency table that allows us to do the calculations which are relatively simple to do by hand. And if you've watched my numbers needed to treat calculation video you'll notice the formulas are very similar to what we see in that video and what we see in calculating numbers needed to treat. The biggest difference is basically how we interpret these. Um, so if you've seen that video and you've done those calculations this should look very familiar to you. So how the 2x2 two two table should be set up and how we it's set up in this example in order for us to calculate these things is the rows indicate the groups. In other words, were you exposed to, to the medication in this example? We're looking at um, whether or not using a certain medication produces some sort of negative side effect or produces an adverse outcome. So the rows represent the people that were exposed to the medication or not exposed to the medication. So the top row would be the people, the experimental group in this case, exposed to the medication. The bottom row would be the control group. In the columns, we have the outcomes. So in the left-hand column, we will have the adverse outcome. So did they have the negative side effect? And then the right-hand column, the center column, will be that they did not have the adverse outcome. In other words, they did not have the side effect. And then the third column will be the total number of subjects uh, involved in the experiment. And so as we look at uh, just the raw data here we can see that it appears that using the medication resulted in a higher rate of the adverse outcome. But we also have to take into account, and the formula will do this, 
how many total people were in each group and how many people did not have the adverse outcome. So looking at the raw data, it appears there's an increased risk, but we're going to be able to quantify that with our additional measures that we're going to do here. So our first calculations we can do is figure out what the experimental event rate is, which is basically the number of people that had the adverse outcome divided by the total number of people that actually took the medication. As we can see here, we have an event rate for the experimental group of 0.115. And then we have our control event rate. And so that's basically the number of people in the non-medication group, control group, that had the adverse outcome divided by the total number of people in the no medication or in the control group. And we can see here the event rate for that group is 0.082. So it appears again that the risk or the event rate for the experimental group is higher than it is for the control group. Our next calculation allows us to get a more definitive quantitative estimate of that risk of the adverse event, and that's the relative risk. So we take our EER value and divide it by the CER value, and this gives us a relative risk of 1.39. And so we interpret this as the experimental group has a 1.39 times greater likelihood of having the adverse event versus the control group. So it's slightly elevated. As we talked about before, 1.0 means there's an equal probability of the adverse outcome in both groups but we have an increased relative risk here, so that means that the experimental group is slightly higher at risk than the control group. Now, if this relative risk was two or three or four, then we could say the experimental group was two, two more times likely, three, three more times likely, four more times likely, and so on to have the adverse, the adverse outcome. Now, the relative risk increase gives us an idea of, a, of the actual increase in the adverse event in the experimental group versus the control group. And again, we take our EER value, and from that we subtract our CER value. And then we take that value into it, we divide the CER value, and we multiply that by 100. So we can say that the relative risk increase is 131% in having the adverse outcome. The next calculation is the absolute risk increase or ARI, and we take our CER value, and from that we subtract the EER value, and we get a absolute risk increase of 0.03, or 3%. And again, we can express that in a percentage. Now our next and final calculation is the numbers needed to harm, and we take our ARI value in its decimal form, not percentage form, and divide it into 1 and that will give us the numbers needed to harm. So here we can see that that value is 33, which means about 33 people will have to be exposed to the medication in order to have one person with the adverse outcome, in other, in other words, one person having the side effect. So again, we like this number to be quite large because that would mean that a lot of people would need to take the medication in order to have the negative side effect. So the smaller that number is, the more likely it is you're going to have the adverse outcome if, if you're exposed to the medication. So again, we'd like this in theory to be as large as possible in order to say that there is not a large chance of having the side effect. If that value is small, closer to 1, that means there is a very large probability or very large risk of having that negative side effect or having that negative outcome or adverse outcome. So to summarize, we, we calculated, learned how to calculate numbers needed to harm, which gives us an idea of the magnitude of risk that is present from being exposed to a treatment or a risk factor or an event and then having an adverse or negative outcome. So hopefully you were able to learn something from this video and good luck using this technique in your own research.